The amount of electricity that we're going to use is, is, is going to more than double in the years ahead as we have more electric vehicles, more heat pumps, and we're going to electrify the nation. If we keep using the energy in the, in the, in the same times of the day and the, in the same behaviours that we have today, things have got to change. We're working today, aren't we, in terms of how to get ready for this kind of reform in market-wide half-hourly, and we're supporting suppliers get ready for this significant change to the industry, which is for me, only the start. This really is game-changing market for reform that's really pro-consumer, putting the customer right at the heart of the energy transition. Market-wide half-hourly, does that get us to, to net zero? I think market-wide half-hourly is a real enabler to get us there. The bedrock of, of our kind of energy future is based on smart meters being deployed across the country. But for market-wide half-hourly to, to, to reach every consumer in every household and every business, really, every consumer has got to have a smart meter. The energy suppliers have got a really exciting time here now to, to use this market-wide half-hourly platform that's really going to be able to see more accurate data being consumed to use that and to incentivize consumers with time of use tariffs to use their energies at different time time of the day. And it really is an enabler to drive that behavior change. Hopefully again, with the new products and services that come to the market for the first time, a smart meter is not being installed to achieve a tick box exercise. A smart meter is being installed because actually the consumer is gonna gain some significant value. The innovation that is likely to come as a result of, of getting this data, bringing in new technology, the amount of data that is now gonna be used to, to measure consumption is it's frightening we need new systems and platforms to support that we're waiting for the kind of netflix of energy essentially to launch into this space and actually help us propel through the next 20 30 years of energy it's a really exciting time for the market so rich we're here today to talk around the subject of market wide half hourly I think for the audience before we jump into market wide and all things around that it's probably worth giving them a a bit of an experience of the wider electricity industry, if that's okay. Sure. So, so I mean, electricity, you know, is generated for, for all of us to use. Um, and that electricity is generated for the demand that we have. And, and that demand varies, you know, it will vary over the winter. It will vary at different times of the day. And ultimately, um, that demand needs to be forecast so that we, we have enough electricity to, you know, to keep the lights on. You know, clearly, uh, electricity is, is changing. You know, there's, you know, we're trying to electrify you know the, the nation so moving away from fossil fuels so as we get into to more electricity you know there's going to be more demand um there's going to be more pressure on the network to you know to provide that energy um there's a real challenge for energy suppliers um they need to predict or forecast uh, what energy or electricity that their consumers are going to use um and what they need to do is is they need to look at probably historic data, historic usage, um, you know, to put into the grid to say, this is how much electricity is going to be used um, by their customers at, at certain parts of the day, you know, throughout the year. So, you know, so that, that forecasting, you know, you know, does become challenging. And I guess it's, it becomes a greater challenge when, you know, there's, there's, there's not the accuracy of the data there because today um, there's probably about a million um, premises um, that have their energy consumption measured on a half hourly basis, which gives the energy supplier a bit more accuracy of when consumption is being used. Um, but for everybody else, um, you pretty much take a couple of reads and, and apply some standard profiles in between those reads. And those reads could be, you know, monthly or quarterly or even annually. And, and you apply a, a standard profile to get an average. Um, so clearly, if, if, if people are really needing to forecast how much electricity is going to be used, I think a lot more granular you know, data of what consumption is actually being used is needed. Um, and and that's, that's a challenge in the electricity market. So I was talking to my 13 year old son in, uh, in preparation for doing this podcast today. And uh, I thought to myself, if I can kind of educate my son on what, you know, the electricity market does and how kind of settlement kind of works, that's a bit of a win. And I kind of gave him um, an analogy. Uh, Cause you're right. There's a finite resource in terms of energy. Um, you know, we, we all expect with the, with, when we press a light switch, the energy turns on, light comes on, etc. So I explained to him food. It's a food a subject that I'm close to and a food that he's close to. So when, um, you know, for instance, I, I, I talk about generators in terms of farmers. I talk about um, restauranters in terms of um, suppliers, energy suppliers, and obviously the consumer at the end of the, at the, end of the process. And I kind of likened it to, you know, if you go into a restaurant, 
they don't know, you know, necessarily when you're going to turn out and what you want to eat. They have to kind of make some kind of provisions and kind of um, give you options when you turn up. And uh, equally, they've got to make provisions to um, their suppliers um, for, to give us the best possible experience at the end of the end of the process. So I kind of likened it to, you know, at, at some point in time, um, consumers are going to get greater choice where they choose what they want on their plate at any particular time. And equally, they might get incentivized to turn up instead of turning at lunchtime or turn up at dinner time, they turn up at breakfast time. And actually, we're trying to get rid of waste. And I think waste is a huge part that we pay in the energy industry. And we also pay in the food industry. Um, and if we can recre- create less waste, that ultimately gives a better price point to the consumer at the end of the process. So um, I talked through that, through that process yesterday and actually gave me a smile. He said, I, 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 can, I can quite understand what you mean there, Dan, actually. And uh, I was quite proud of myself to actually take them through that. But it was an interesting to kind of relate it to something that we all kind of, um, we all know and talk about. Um, for him was an important thing. So uh, yeah, it was good. I think it's a brilliant analogy. I mean, because if everybody turned up to the restaurant at the same time, <clears throat> then there wouldn't be enough food for everybody, you know, to eat, you know, um, and that's exactly the same with, with, with electricity. You know, if we all wanted all of our electricity all at the same time, then the demand, you know, we, you know, we wouldn't be there. It wouldn't be there for, you know, for us to have that electricity that we require. So, um, so ultimately, I guess that the peaks and troughs of when we use electricity is, is really becoming a challenge as well. Um, you know, I think I touched on earlier that, you know, the, the amount of electricity that we're going to use is, is, is going to more than double in the years ahead as we have more electric vehicles, more heat pumps, and, you know, basically to kind of get rid of fossil fuels that help um, generate our electricity as well, you know, is that, you know, we're going to electrify the nation. Um, and, you know, if we if we keep using the energy in the, in the, in the same times of the day and the, and the same behaviours that we have today, you know, we might not be able to put the lights on and they work, you know? So, um, you know, things have got to change, you know, we can't all go to the restaurant at the same time and everybody expects, you know, to have food there and then, you know? Um, you know, so we've, we've got to, I guess, flatten the load. We've got to, you know, try and remove some of those peaks and troughs and, and try and flatten it so that there's a more of a stable, um, state of electricity, you know, kind of being used and, you know, it allows energy supplies to, to forecast, um, more accurately to, to make sure that we have got the electricity we need to, you know, to keep those lights on. So Rich, what is market-wide half hourly settlement and why should we care about it? It's a good question. I mean, we should care because it's the future. You know, it's, this is where we're going. It's the enabler to, to net zero. It's massively important in terms of, um, you know, the environmental change that, that it will have an impact on as we go through this uh, net zero journey to 2050. Um, what is it? Well, it's an off-gem obligated reform. Um, the obligation has been put on the energy suppliers to move all their energy consumers to to a new market that that measures their energy consumption in a more granular detail. We've already said that you know up until now is that there's a lot of estimation that takes place in terms of how you know people use their energy, they use their electricity, and we need to get a lot more granular into what what that looks like. So. Market-wide half-hourly settlements, I, I guess the, the clues in, in the description, you know, it is market-wide, you know, so everything in the electricity market has to change to this, uh, to this new operating model. Um, so it, anybody that's involved in electricity, so from generation to transmission to retailing to collecting data to installing meters, it is market-wide. Everybody has to change, you know, with this new reform. Um, half-hourly, well, um, you know, we're now moving from, like I say, that estimated, you know, way of understanding what the consumption is, is being used to, to really accurately or more accurately measuring consumption on a half hourly basis. So every day, every all week for the entire year, consumption will be measured on a half hourly basis, you know, and, and, and that's quite key to make sure there's more accuracy in terms of the forecasting, you know, to kind of predict how much energy, how much electricity needs to be generated to meet our demand. Settlement, that's where it becomes a little bit more complicated, but but in essence, you know, um, an energy supplier, um, you know, they have to do this forecast. They have to, you know, sort of say to the network how much electricity needs to be generated to fulfill their customer requirements. Um, once you go through that whole forecasting process of, of making sure there's enough coming in, um, you know, after the event, you know, all that half hourly data needs to be measured to understand who used what to make sure that, um, you know, the right people pay the bill, you know, so the energy consumer will pay the supplier, but then the supplier has to pay, you know, you know, a serious amount of charges to 
you know, all the way to the generation that generated it. So the settlement side of it at the end is, is using that half hourly data to make sure that everybody settles their bill. Yeah. And I guess that comes back to, um, from my perspective, kind of what's driving all this, all this change. Um, what are the key drivers behind um, smart metering? What are the drivers behind market wide half hourly? And on a kind of macro level, this is back down to, um, you know, we've obviously got a government that's pushing forward a net zero agenda, uh, a 2050 net zero agenda, um, which, you know, I'm deeply, deeply passionate about in terms of how we get there. And certainly for my kids and my grandkids, um, you, know, you want to, them to be living in an environment that is, is, is sustainable, you know, and I think that's a key word that you'll hear over and over again in terms of trying to make energy more sustainable. So it's about looking after what we already generate and how do we generate more energy, more re- from new renewable sources and, and by changing from, uh, you know, uh, a carbon intensive kind of fuel to a more renewable fuel, which is clearly key as part of the kind of net zero transition. Um, we've got to change our, um, we've got to change our behaviors, you know, in terms of how we consume that energy. Because I think, as Matt said in the, one of the previous podcasts, the sun can't, can't shine any brighter and the wind can't blow any harder. So we have to use uh, consumer behavior, change consumer behaviors, but give them the ability through reform, through the implementation of smart metering um, and through the introduction of new technology that's going to come into this market to drive that change and give consumer choice and put them right front and center. And that net zero agenda is massive. You know, the environment is, you know, is under, is under pressure and we, we have to do something about it. This isn't you know, something we can just keep talking about. We have to do something about it. And, and, and you know, just, just listen to what you said there around, um, you know, about that electricity, the, you know, the security of, of, of energy has come under question in recent times as well. I mean, all the troubles in the world um, that have recently had, and all of a sudden we saw that, you know, I think everybody then recognised that, that, that gas that was being imported from other parts of, of the world was was being used to kind of generate our electricity, and that that caused a, a you know a real crisis for you know you know for us in this country because that security wasn't there, and you know and I guess you know not only we're we going on a, um, a net zero agenda to 2050, we've got to make sure we've got that security of our of our own you know um, of our own own energy, and that is you know comes a lot down to generating our own electricity, you know, from renewable sources and trying to move away from, you know, from a lot of these fossil fuels. And, you know, it's a really important step, you know, to kind of be environmentally friendly, which I'm sure is a, you know, you know, you talk about your kids and, and things like that, you know, it's, it's a massively important thing for all of us, you know, to, to take on, you know, we, you can't leave this world the way it's going and for everybody to be safe and have that security. So um, we have to change. And, um, you know, I think, you know, that is fundamentally clear. Um, Market-wide half hourly, does that get us to, to net zero? Not on its own. I think market-wide half hourly is a real enabler, um, you know, to get us there. So I think we probably need to try and explain a little bit more about what, what actually market-wide half hourly, you know, is going to do for us to enable us to keep going on this journey to, you know, to net zero by 2050. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think crucially, you know, we've we've seen over recent years that, you know, the bedrock of, of our kind of energy future is based on smart meters being deployed across the country. Um, I think there were about 30 million, I think, smart meters deployed across the country. It's probably 60% of the UK population that's got a smart meter. Um, but, but for market-wide half hourly to, to, to reach every consumer in every household and every business, really, every house and every consumer has got to have a smart meter deployed. And there's clearly 40% of the market still yet to go and Go and complete. Um, hopefully, again with again the new products and services that come to the market on the back of things like market wide half hourly, that further incentivizes customers to want to have a smart meter installed. Because you know the one thing I I I, I view myself is that for the first time, a smart meter is not being installed to achieve a a, a kind of tick box exercise. A smart meter is being installed because actually the consumer is going to gain some significant value in that process, whatever that value is to them, you know, whether it's a price point, whether it's control, whether it's better suiting their lifestyle and their requirements, which will, which will differ for everyone, won't it? And, and just coming back to, you know, sort of the, the electricity industry and how it's set up today. I mean, the setup that we have today was, was set up in the 90s, you know, and, you know, and obviously that, you know, things have moved on over the last 30 years, you know, so we have to change. But, you know, this, this approach of 
of, of, of estimating when energy is being used really doesn't help that accurate forecasting of when we need that electricity, especially when we're going to double the amount of electricity that we need. So, you know, so for me, market-wide half hourly um, is moving everybody, you know, to kind of get in their energy electricity consumption measured on a half hourly basis, you know, so we've, we've only got about a million sites today that, that do that. And, you know, everybody that's going to move into, into that, into that basis by having that smart meter that will be able to measure your electricity com- consumption on a half hourly basis, using that data then to then accurately, you know, forecast when we need the demand. Um, but then using that data to incentivize people to, you know, to perhaps use their energy at different times so that we can flatten the load and we don't have these peaks and troughs that, you know, that will put the, the network under real stress. And, you know, many people will probably be thinking, well, I don't want to cook my dinner at different times of the day. You know, I, I don't, you know, I need to put the lights on when it's dark, you know? So there's lots of things that, that people will be thinking of or not wanting to change. So, I mean, what, what sort of things do you think will change as a result of market-wide half hourly and, you know, and, and the need for behavior to change? I think there are a couple of key fundamentals, I think, that, 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 again, consumers, and I think through the energy supplier is such a pivotal kind of part of this market uh, and to attempt enabling kind of consumers to get the best benefit of smart meters and, and like I said, market-wide half-value reform. I would say, you know, we're, we're seeing some benefits already now, actually. Like I said, you just mentioned a million, uh, you know, customers are already kind of taking advantage of being settled in a half hourly market. What's driven that, I think, more than anything else, probably the introduction of EV electric vehicles across the country and and the need to recognise that, you know, yeah, can we push their kind of, um, uh, you know, demand to, you know, the, the kind of overnight uh, when the grid is at its kind of, they've got the most capacity available, um, price points are a bit cheaper to kind of generate, therefore those price points can be passed on to the customer. So, Consumers are already starting to see some of those benefits um, and we can certainly see some active suppliers in the market that are already offering smart enabled tariffs, but we're just at the start of that process. I think we're, we're going to see, I think, a huge increase in terms of consumer driven tariffs that suit specific, you know, consumption patterns that suit their particular requirements and customers will have the choice of different tariffs that suit their needs and different suppliers that offer different tariffs for them. So I think, um, you know, th- th- those are a couple of some of the benefits we're already seeing as well, actually, through the flexibility market. Um, a number of suppliers um, actually within the industry choosing to operate with, under the uh, national grid scheme where actually they will get essentially paid for not consuming in certain hours of the day. So not only can you now choose to, uh, you know, put your consumption at a time of the day that's cheapest, you can actually get paid not to consume, which is a real novelty and, and something that, you know, I didn't see happening quite as quickly as it has. And it's brilliant to see it happening. And those kind of innovations are only going to get more significant and more substantial, which is great for you and us and the other 30 million cons- consumers across the UK. Yeah. I mean, a friend of mine, he, you know, he was describing how he's, you know, he's got solar panels on his roof. Um, he's got a, an electric vehicle, um, you know, so he, he will ultimately um, charge his car from his solar panels. And then he was saying to me the other day, he was very proud of himself. He was saying that, you know, when, when his electricity was really expensive, he, he's actually got the technology to to actually take the energy out of his car to, you know, to, I think he was putting the washing machine on at a peak time or something. So, so, so rather than paying for energy off the grid at the most expensive time of day, um, he was actually getting it from the sun during, you know, during the morning putting it into his car and then using that electricity at a time where it was most expensive. So it didn't cost him. So it cost him cheaper in the morning. So, so, you know, people think they're not going to change their behaviors of when they're going to do things. And it would be great if, if, if people do do, you know, things differently, you know, but ultimately, you know, people still need energy at certain parts of the day, but it's about where do you get that energy from at that part of the day? You know, it wouldn't be great if the, that automation was there, you know, from your, your EV, lots of us are going to have EV vehicles in the future and, you know, is that you actually use your, your EV as a battery. You know, you can store the energy that you've kind of put into there at a cheap time of the day and you use that energy at a peak time. And lots of things like that will help us flatten the load and, and you know, and ease the demand, you know, on, you know, on the network. 
and I 100% agree with you, Chris, you know, the, the energy suppliers have got a really exciting time here now to, to use this market-wide half-hourly platform that's, you know, that's really going to be able to see more accurate data being consumed to use that and to incentivize consumers with time of use tariffs to, you know, to use their energies at different time, time of the day, you know, and, you know, and it really is an enabler to drive that behavior change. Absolutely. So when we, I guess, going back to the, you know, market wide and the kind of reform, there's no doubt in my mind, it's the kind of single biggest market reform since privatization and maybe the industry and as, as old as I am, you know, that's a long time ago. And it's a, it's a big, significant reform with all the benefits we've just, we've just articulated. I guess, do you want to give us your thoughts in terms of how is this going to impact you know, consumers and, and on what kind of time basis, you know, wh- when is market, when is this reform happening? And, um, you know, when can c- customers start to receive that kind of benefit? Well, it's been happening for a while. You know, this is, this has been working in progress for, for a number of years, you know, so you, you talked about, you know, having smart meters installed, um, you know, market wide half hourly will be largely successful, you know, you know, if, if more and more people have smart meters. So, you know, you touched on earlier, 60% of, Great Britain now have smart meters installed and that continues to grow through energy suppliers doing their smart meter rollouts. So, you know, that will continue to happen. Um, what that then basically means is, is that you can collect the data, you know, from those smart meters and be able to see, you know, on a half hourly basis, what is being used. And, um, and that new, that new process for measuring electricity usage is changing through this new operating model, the market wide half hourly operating model, um, that starts to, go live. So you can start to migrate into this new model um, from April 2025. Um, and everybody would have migrated into having, you know, their consumption measured on a half hourly basis by the end of 2026. So um, there's a, there's, it's not like there's a, a, a big turn on and all of a sudden, you know, everybody all of a sudden is in, in the same, you know, new market. There is a transition, you know, over 18 months or so to to allow everybody to plan and allow everybody to kind of switch over, you know, at the right time, our en- our systems to to kind of support this have pretty much been based on what was generated in the nineties, you know. So many parties in you know in the industry that either generate electricity or transfer electricity or supply electricity or for like what we do as well, where we collect, you know, the data is that you know, a lot of the foundations have been built on platforms and systems from the nineties. Um, that all needs to fundamentally change. You know, the amount of data that is now going to be used to, to measure consumption is, you know, it's frightening. You know, it's, you know, if you think that you know, we're going from 30 million premises, probably having a say three or four reads a year to all of a sudden you, you're having, you know, 48 reads a day, you know, it's, you know, it's phenomenal amount of data that will be collected and transferred and, and, you know, we need new systems and platforms to support that. So, so lots of companies are currently going through huge IT transformation programs to get ready for that migration. You know, there's lots of system integration testing taking place right now, um, all to get ready for the start of this migration that will be um, commencing from sort of April 25, you know, to conclude by the end of 2026 are the fundamental key dates. And I guess, again, going back to the point that, you know, migration is a, is a measured, it's a, it's a, it's a, a process that's going to be planned thoroughly um, through all the partners that are involved in that process. But crucially, consumers won't be able to go through that process unless they've got a smart meter uh, deployed. I mean, we're better than that still. They've got a smart meter that's operating and connecting remotely. So we can't, we can't forget these are, these are remotely connected devices that no different to our mobile phone to some degree that, require the network to kind of send the data over. So, um, you know, we need to make sure those two golden rules of having a smart meter deployed and having robust and reliable data from your smart meter are two prerequisites to going through this planned and measured migration process. Yeah, and look, not everybody is going to have a smart meter by, you know, just April 25 or by the end of 2026. There are going to be some of those outliers that, I mean, they don't have a, a smart meter and, and ultimately there's a, there's a new process of, 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 you know, of how, you know, their approach will be settled and, and, and estimated, you know, over that period of time. But, you know, certainly the, you know, the vast increase of smart meters into the market will, will, will certainly make market wide half hourly operating model more effective, you know, to take us on that journey to net zero. Um, but your point on smart meters is, you know, is very valuable. You know, these are, have been installed for quite some time. 
you know, they are a, a newer technologies and the AMR meters that have been traditionally installed into into business premises and large businesses. Um, and and they do work on on firmware, you know, so the the smart meters in your in your property, um, you'll have an electricity meter, you'll have a, a gas meter, um, and you'll have probably have an, an IHD, an in-home display that that connects through this home area network. And and to keep that connection going, they're all kind of, you know, have this firmware that keeps them talking to each other that then transfers this data, you know, to a central source for, you know, for energy suppliers to use and and to use that forecasting that we've talked about. Um, you know, like your phone, if you don't keep your, your the software on your phone up to date, all of a sudden it will stop it will stop working or it will start running slower. And it really is crucial to have, you know, the firmware on your smart meters kept up to date. And I think we've recognized in, in, in recent years in, and then for the work that we've done and the research that we've done and all that testing that, we, that, you know, that, that we've completed for the industry, it's clear to see that, you know, that not all these smart meters that have been installed have had their firmware kept, kept up to date, have they? It's, uh, you know, these are, these are mini computers, I call it, you know, in, in, in all our properties. And unless they're kind of maintained properly, um, unless they're kind of visited occasionally, unless they're kind of talked to remotely and kept up, 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 up you know, the firm's up to date, then there's no doubt that will, that will have an impact in terms of the robustness of the data coming through it. And because of the demand for data now through market wide, as you say, 48 intervals a day across 30 million, um, you know, uh, you know, meters, electricity meters, the demand is phenomenal and you need that base, baseline profile data to make um, market wide be the success that it will be and should be. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, to keeping this, these firmware up to date for energy supplies, you know, you know, as we know, a number of these energy supplies didn't even know it was their obligation to do so, let alone know how to do it, you know? So a lot of energy, energy supplies are going to need help and support keeping these meters talking because um, otherwise they're not going to be able to collect that half value data to do all the things, you know, that, that we've spoken about. So it is really crucial. And what we can't forget here. Is that we we talked a lot about smart meters because I, I guess that's what's generally going into domestic properties, you know, and you know, and that's what's kind of really going to enable you know market wide half alley to to work, you know, moving domestic properties into this half alley settled uh, way. But you know, we've we've got AMR meters, you know, that have traditionally been installed for you know for 10, 20, 25 years now. Um, and we can't forget about those, you know, equally, you know, those AMR meters that will you know be installed in businesses and um, and, you know, and some dom large domestic properties, you know, they have their own challenges, particularly around, you know, sort of the, the 2G, 3G network that's, that's going to be switched off by 2033. Yeah. You know, there's, uh, so much to do in that sense. It's, it's, it's a really exciting time for the market in terms of moving towards market wide half hourly. Um, I think, yes, there's some fundamental pillars as part of it, you know, to make sure that we, uh, we get the, the consumer gets the kind of service and the kind of capability that they that they need to kind of um be part of that process um and that, that there's been a huge amount of lessons learned over over the over recent years like I said with 30 meters 30 millimeters already on the wall out there you know that's not an unsubstantial kind of amount of uh, meters out there and you know through that we've all learned incredible lot in terms of how to keep those meters alive how to keep them working and to get them ready fundamentally you know we're working today aren't we in terms of how to get them ready for this kind of reform in market wide half hourly. And, you know, we're supporting um, suppliers as are lots of different counterparts across the industry, get ready for this significant change to the industry, which is for me only the start, I think of, of, of a huge range of benefits that are going to come to UK kind of PLC in terms of, um, you know, getting us better equipped for our own, like so from a security, energy security point of view, from a, from a kind of, um, you know, improving the kind of carbon and decarbonization of the, the kind of industry. But fundamentally, for me, putting the consumer back in the box seat in terms of being able to control um, how they consume energy and let them make decisions, you know, based on price points, based on um, their consumption behaviours, Based on you know their ability to control and automate different parts of the uh, of the household or business they're in. So I guess we've talked uh, a lot, you know, quite a bit about the need for you know getting more data, you know, getting more accurate data of consumption, so that we can we can forecast and um, and make sure we can meet the meet the demand. We've talked about 
you know, that need to you know, have a smart meter or an AMR meter installed at a premise so that that data can be collected um, and ultimately used by, you know, different parties. Um, you, know, you, know, you know, that's critical to, you know, sort of the foundation of where this is going that's going to keep us on this net zero journey. Um, in terms of, you know, what's out there today and what you think is going to be out there, you know, in the years to come, I mean, where, what sort of innovation um, do you think is, is, is going to happen as a result of all this data to really start to give consumers benefit? I think at a, at a kind of base level, it's, you know, and we're seeing some of it now, you know, I know I can actually tap into my, um, uh, I don't know what to say it, but an in-home uh, voice controlled uh, device at home. I can already talk to that uh, device and I can already ask it to go and talk to my, to my, to my energy meter, my, my electricity meter. And it can tell me, and the gas meter for that matter, it can tell us how much we consume. So we're, we're seeing already some of that innovation in terms of, you know, almost real time access to data. And that's just, again, for me, um, allowing consumers to see every day, yesterday, you know, last week, um, you know, how they've consumed energy and, and they can start to take a little bit of an interest. So that's kind of, for me, very much kind of base camp. So consumers start to see some data. I think that's really, really important. Um, I think beyond that, it's actually how do we um, change behaviours and how do you incentivize behaviours? Like I said, I think it comes back to um, tariffs and I think more time of use tariffs that's, you know, more choice for the customer on those time of use tariffs. Those are really important. And I think the really exciting part is around, I think, innovation in technology that's going to take, you know, we're humans, we make mistakes, we don't often, you know, we're pretty routine orientated um, and we like to live our lives by that and that's fine. But actually, if computers, AI can start to do this kind of thinking and heavy lifting for you by talking from device to device, device to your meter, um, device to battery storage to I say your solar panels, your car, um, your air source heat pump, your fridge, your oven, you know, your dishwasher. If all those are integrated into your network and it then makes the decisions on when to kind of make that device available at the cheapest time of day that suits your particular need, that I think is when we're going to see um, significant kind of transition in the industry. But like I said, it's, it's all founded on, you know, giving the consumer access to data and then actually creating a, a suite of products and services that best suit their lifestyle and they can make decisions that best suit them. Because you're right, this, this industry can sound ever so complicated. You know, when we talk about tariffs and time of use tariffs and we talk about, you know, people talk about kilowatt hours and standing charges and stuff. You know, I think about my own parents and stuff, and quite often, you know, they won't understand some of the complications of what the elect electricity market is all about. Um, you know, we've seen some really good visualization tools now, though, where, you know, people can, you know, people can see a chart and they can see the time of the day and they can see what energy they've been used and they can see how much they're being charged. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting where, you know, you know, people, people will say, you know, you talk to lots of people working at home and they, you know, and, and, and they'll say, oh, it's just cost me 25p to boil the kettle and stuff, you know, where, where you start to bring that energy to life in, in real words and money, you know, without talking about the complications of the industry and things is that I think customers seeing, you know, you know, their energy usage in the palm of their hand. Uh, or on their computer is is really powerful right now, and you know there's some really good applications out there that are starting to use AI to start to encourage the customers to do things differently. You know, to say, look, you know, did you know if you if you changed your behaviour at this point of the day to something else, it would have saved you X amount of pounds. So, so, so that all comes from having the data, giving it to to the AI to learn from you know what you're doing and you know and and the, and the detail consumption that that, it, that it's aware of. And putting something visual in your hand so that you can see what's going on, and and you know, and people do start to engage more with energy if they can if they can see something a bit more straightforward and a bit more understandable, don't they? Yeah, and there's it's, it's no doubt we've seen. You know, this this is not necessarily anything new in many ways because, as, you know, if you go slightly up the kind of, um, you know, the the kind of food chain in terms of larger businesses, they've been operating in that half hourly market for thirty plus years. 
and enjoyed some of the benefits of that. And, and, and what we have definitely witnessed through that time is, you know, um, you know, whilst energy is a cost thing in terms of, and that's very much important in terms of businesses, in terms of driving value, um, very much there's a, you know, how do we consume better? How do we make better decisions? How do we invest in new technology across our business? But they can only do that if they fundamentally understand what they're consuming when they consume it. So um, we've seen the benefits in the kind of industrial and commercial market. And the great thing is that's being rolled out now to, to everyone across the UK um, for the benefit of everyone um, and, and us as a kind of nation, which I think is something we can't lose sight of in terms of our, you know, our significance across the, the globe um, to be a leader in this kind of space. Um, to be, um, you know, passionate about driving decarbonisation and, 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 and promoting, you know, consumer being at the heart of the energy industry. And I think Ofgem have, have, have put out there as part of their business case for the introduction of market-wide half hourly to say that energy consumers will save £4.5 billion by 2050, you know, over the next 25 years. Um, you know, I think that could be fairly conservative. Um, you know, the innovation that is likely to come as a result of, you know, of, of getting this data, um, bringing in new technologies. You know, you talked about automation um, a little bit earlier. I think, you know, keeping it simple for the customer, you know, somebody making the decisions for you behind the scenes so that, the, you know, you're getting the best use of your energy, knowing that you are contributing towards a, an environmentally friendly future, um, you know, is going to be powerful. So even though, there's a lot of money, 4.5 billion pounds that off Jim are saying, you know, consumers will save. I think it will go beyond that. I think, you know, I think that monetary value could, could exceed it by far. But I think the, you know, there's, there's other values and other benefits that I think people will be really excited about over the years to come. Absolutely. And I think that like, you can't forget around, you know, you know, obviously, you know, devices and technology that the, the, there's cost to some of this, you know, there's no doubt there is, but I think, as as the market opens up, as more competition comes in, as more finance probably enters the market, there'll be the ability to kind of fund some of this net of technology um, through various different means. So, you know, I don't think everyone's going to be prohibited from it because of cost. I think I think competition and innovation is going to collide, and actually, I think more and more of the kind of customer base is going to get given access to this type of technology because we know we need it as a as a as a as a, as a nation. If you just think back to, you know, you know, when smartphones first came out, you know, you know, we used to have a phone, we used to use it to make phone calls and text messages and things like that. And, and then smartphones came out where you can kind of start to do photos and videos and, and watch things. And now, you know, that you can do so much more. There's so much innovation has come through a smartphone over the last, you know, sort of 15 years or so, you know, where you can do your banking, you can book your holidays, you can do, you know, almost everything on your phone nowadays. You know, so that that smartphone has really enabled innovation. Now, a smart meter, let's be frank, it's not going to be as exciting. People won't get excited about a, a smart meter like the world about a smartphone. But that principle of innovation driven by smart technology will come. You know, these smart meters will drive innovation that people will get excited about, these future products and services that we may not even know what they are today, but they will make a real big difference in people's lives and you know in the years to come. Well, I, th I think the phone is a, is, is a great example, but it's also the, you know, it's, it's the common um, smart device across most consumers, perhaps putting the non-domestic consumer market to one side a little bit. That's the common interface, you know, and actually, you know, the industry um, has got to, you know, the industry's got to become more smart enabled, become more kind of integrated. Um, to allow the smart meter then to talk to other apps and other technologies that are already sitting on that smart meter. So I think the smart meters are, is, is, is part of the overall kind of um, consumer engagement piece, really, to make sure that everything they consume is probably going to be through that smart device, less through a TV these days and more through your smart device. And the more control you give to that customer on their energy through that smart device, which I think smart meters and access to this data fundamentally does. Once that's integrated with the rest of the uh, smart appliances out there through that smartphone, I think that's when we're really, you know, for me, talking about the uberfication. You know, we're waiting for the kind of Netflix of energy essentially to 
to kind of really launch into this space and actually, you know, help us propel through the next 20, 30 years of, uh, of, of energy. Absolutely, Chris. I mean, so, you know, you talked about cost, you know, everybody's going through a change right now, you know, that's part of this electricity industry. Everybody needs to upgrade their platforms and systems and things like that. That's not going to come cheap, but I think people can really start to see companies can really start to see the benefits of being part of this market-wide high value operating model, you know, and the operating model is just purely how parties in this industry communicate with each other, you know, so that, you know, that we can actually, um, you know, get, get, you know, get the electricity that we need to meet the demand that's there, you know, is that there's, you know, it is a model, but this, this operating model that's been put into play um, really does open up the door to innovation. So lots of companies right now are, are really invested in new platforms, new services, um, you know, you know, to make the future really exciting. Absolutely. And those suppliers will fundamentally need support from lots of different partners across the industry to, to make this all happen. So, um, yeah, a, a, a lot for suppliers to do, but a huge amount of support around them, I think. And um, I think, again, one of the key parts of the process that we've hopefully kind of covered today is around migration and, and, and the need to ensure that process happens smoothly, happens diligently. Um, and I guess it's something we can probably touch on in a bit more detail in terms of the, the kind of timings of that uh, migration process. So I think we touched on earlier, it's, it's many years in the making. Um, and, you know, you know, everybody's going through these system changes right now. Um, and again, that is, you know, very, very closely monitored to make sure that, that people have the right um, systems and processes in place to support this new target operating model. Um, there's lots of different readiness, readiness assessment processes people are going through, lots of different stages of um of testing you know whether you're a party that's going to collect the data whether you're an energy supplier you know there's there's a, there's a heavily you know kind of regulated and controlled process because i guess it's it's you know it's the new way of you know kind of getting your accreditation to you know to make sure you can work in this industry you know so parties that are in, you know involved in this today rather than to have to you know kind of you know go through that accreditation process again which is you know as we know you know very lengthily um, you know, is, is that proving that you can work in this, um, you know, in, you know, in this new operating model is the way that you can gain that accreditation to keep, you know, to keep working. So, so everybody's going through this significant change right now in system development and things like that. So, um, I guess supporting each other through it, you know, it is quite key. So we'll get to a place where migration starts, um, and then we've got to migrate customers, you know, so customers have got to move from, um, you know, today's market into the new market. Um, you know, and that's going to be a big, you know, a big transition. It's going to be a big migration. There's 18 months to do that. Um, and based upon current tariffs that uh, customers have today, um, you know, if you move a customer today from this, this estimated profile into an accurate half hourly settlement profile, then, then all of a sudden it could be that the tariff they're on, their energy bill goes up uh, technically, you know, and it, and it could be that uh, another customer, their energy bill goes down. So, you know, as part of this migration, there really does need to be um, a real focus on um, what are the right cohorts of customers to migrate to this new operating model first, you know, because, you know, you don't really want consumers having to spend, you know, pay lots more energy and lots more money on their energy, you know, to kind of as a result of going to this new model, do we? You certainly don't want customers being disadvantaged by going through this process. Um, as you say, it will, it will, it will all be different for every customer, but I think the lessons we've learned certainly through, um, elective half hourly, um, and, and, and even from like the, the commercial market, yeah, the, the need to understand, uh, and obviously through other migrations that happened in recent years, and we've got the scars on the, on the, uh, and the kind of, um, uh, you know, wounds from those kind of, uh, migrations, it's really important that a, the customers um, uh, you know, part of the conversation. Um, but more than that as well is making sure that, yeah, we're, we're not disadvantaged to them by doing them too early, doing them too late. Um, they're migrating because they've got, uh, an infrastructure, a smart meter infrastructure that is capable of, 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 of going across to, to market wide half hourly. Um, but I think, yeah, having the customer kind of engaged in that process in some way. So then there's no, surprise you know and, and that's what you know I, I think what we hear loud and clear from when i speak to you know um friends family etc about the energy market sometimes it's just 
they don't feel in control of it and therefore they don't know what they don't know. So I think um, trying to educate uh, consumers through the process, trying to support suppliers through the process, through different um, uh, means of doing that, through our software packages or through uh, just our understanding of the market, I think is hopefully going to make that process not just seamless, but hopefully just you know less painful for consumers. And, and, and a more benefit than a, than a disadvantage. Yeah, and you talk about half value elective, and these are um, selected customers that have moved from their estimated, you know, kind of billing platform to to having, you know, you know, being settled on this half value basis. Um, you know, because obviously it's 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 beneficial to them. Um, you know, in terms of you know how they consume their energy at, at different points of the day is that they are most likely using you know, their energy outside of the peak times, i.e. charging, they're charging their vehicles in the middle of the night or, you know, they, they are, you know, they are helping, you know, I, I guess, flatten that load, you know, so half a elective has, has been really beneficial to, you know, to some customers already. And, you know, we touched on now, there's about a million customers, um, you know, and that's growing as more domestic customers move into this half a elective process before market-wide half hourly migration even commences. And, and it's really using that learning you know, from the half hourly elective technologies to really identify those other customers, you know, and, you know, looking at their data, looking at their smart data, really understanding, you know, what their energy consumption is right now and recommending to those energy suppliers to say, these are the customers that should migrate to market wide half hourly first. You know, there's a, there's a sort of an 18 month window um, to migrate customers. Clearly it's going to be done in stages. It's not going to go big bang. So actually using um, that half hourly elective principle to help energy suppliers migrate their customers, you know, in a controlled and, and um, you know, an, an organized manner to the benefit of the customer is going to be a really good thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think market wide just becomes the start of that whole conversation and bringing the customer front and center. So we've talked about the sort of flexibility for sort of demand side response technologies. Um, but that word flexibility is, is probably a key word as we as we approach market wide half hourly. I think it's fair to say as we've, as we've been out talking to lots of customers around what their requirements are for market wide half hourly, that word flexibility has, has come out an awful lot. Um, in terms of building systems, platforms, I mean, market wide half hourly is a consistent platform we're all going to work towards, but there really is a need for flexibility of, of people working together within this operating model, isn't there, from what we found? I think what we've, you know, having listened to lots of customers over recent weeks, months, there's no doubt every supplier has got a slightly different um, requirement. It probably reflects, to be fair, the different customer requirements they've got within their base. So some have got lots of prepayment customers, some have got lots of commercial customers, some have got lots of just credit, you know, normal customers, and some have got you know, actually they're already on this journey and I've got a clear view in terms of what they want. Equally, some need to be more led down that process, it's fair to say. Um, I think um, it's really important that, you know, any, any, any system that's, that's brought to market and certainly, um, you know, ones that we're kind of involved in, it's important they're able to cater for that whole, you know, wide variety of kind of capabilities and requirements out there. and. Um, the ability to listen, the ability to um, design a solution um, that works for them that's that's fundamentally based on the principles of of the kind of mandate um, is extremely important and um, certainly it's becoming more increasingly important as we as we kind of are at this stage of the the, the kind of um, market wide halfway process where you know there's no doubt suppliers are now having to take decisions on who they want to operate with, who the systems they need to integrate with. Um, and that can be a daunting process for lots of, for lots of different reasons. But crucially, I think is, is, is having a system that is adaptable that can offer different levels of integration that can integrate with different parties, uh, that can build on existing capability, but also adapt to the new as well. So, it makes the world slightly more complicated, but actually ultimately it's about delivering the right solution for the right supplier that again, ultimately delivers the right end product for the consumer, for their consumer base. Because we're starting to see now, which is really exciting, energy suppliers thinking about 
differentiators for themselves you know, across other energy suppliers. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not just thinking about how do I, you know, work with faster switching? How do I work with this new operating model? You know, what system requirements do I need? You know, we really now start to see energy suppliers, you know, started to think about differentiation. And I think as we're talking to lots of energy suppliers, you know, that, that flexibility comes out loud and clear. They're, they're all looking to do slightly different things. And, you know, and, and I think as a, as a provider and as a supporter to, to energy suppliers, you know, we, we've certainly got that mindset to kind of really listen and, and to, you know, to understand that flexibility because, you know, is that you don't want a one size fits all solution, do you? You know, is that, you know, um, this is a, you know, a market that energy suppliers are trying to give differentiation to the energy consumer and, you know, people have got to support that. It's a competitive market, yeah, and we want it to be a really competitive market because only then do we, the customer, truly get choice. And and, and again, I'm something I'm really passionate about is making sure consumers, as they move forward and have different requirements, they're able to get those different requirements from different different suppliers that are out there. So I think that competition is is fundamental. We've kind of missed it really over the last. Um, post COVID and uh, post various different geopolitical kind of events that are going on, um, that um, that competition has, has has kind of eked away, but it's coming back. And as particularly as we accelerate now towards market wide half hourly, that competition is is going to heat up and heat up, and 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 ultimately that's going to be a great position for consumers to be in to choose a energy supplier, a partner that they want to work with, it gives them the best kind of solution for their specific needs. And if we're part of that by enabling some of that through the systems and technology that we can impart, then, then absolutely that's, that's what we're all about. And, um, long may that continue. And we're starting to see, you know, you know, energy suppliers, you know, um, you know, they they can see the need for differentiation. They can see the need to change. Um, but they also can now start to see that some of them need some help. You know they need some support. You know there's there's going to be a you know to create that differentiation. There's a there's a real need to start thinking about tariffs. You know time of use tariffs, really incentivizing customers with exciting tariffs of how they can save money and you you know really use their energy at different times of the day to you know to keep us on this net zero journey. But you know is that I think energy suppliers are starting to recognise that 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 skill set of people being able to design tariffs, you know, has probably come out of the market, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years. So, um, you know, I think providing energy supplies with that support of how they can build tariffs, you know, is really important, um, you know, because what, what is going to happen as well is, is that energy supplies are, are going to offer a tariff to a customer to, you know, to kind of, you know, th- describes how, you know, they're going to have to pay for their energy at different times of the day. And then a customer um, is going to go and buy an EV and the customer is going to go and buy, you know, um, uh, put a solar on the roof or, you know, they're, you know, they're going to have an air source heat pump. And all of a sudden that changes the dynamic of, of how they use energy. And, and, you know, for an energy supplier, they could have put a customer on a particular tariff to make sure that one, they can forecast the demand, but also, you know, cover their costs and, you know, make some profit. Um, but if all of a sudden a customer puts an EV in and, and that could completely damage the tariff that they've designed and created. So having an alarm system, having some sort of, you know, update, you know, to say, you know, this tariff has all of a sudden, you know, may have been compromised because the customer's changed the behaviour. I think that's going to be a powerful tool moving forward as well. Yeah, we're going to live in a dynamic, a dynamic world, aren't we? As as we transition away from uh, gas, as we move, place more dependency on electricity, as we start to see more um, technology coming into the home and businesses to control that. Um, absolutely, um, you need to make sure you've. Uh, You've got a tariff and a, and a kind of dynamic tariff, really, that kind of almost moves with you. Um, so, um, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, gone are the days, I think, where you're fixed on a tariff for um, a year or two or three years. Hopefully, we'll see an environment where actually new tariffs can come into the market every day. Obviously, with faster switching along, you know, customers got the, again, the power to switch, haven't they? So, uh, with that competition, with that choice, um, I think uh, will ensure that suppliers have the customer front and centre, and make sure they can deliver a tariff dynamically as their worlds, you know, as their kind of environments change, 
and 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 kind of being able to react to changing demand that perhaps out, happens out there. And uh, only then, I think, have we got a truly dynamic energy market. And I, I don't think it's that far away in truth. This really is game-changing market for reform that's really pro-consumer um, and putting the, the, the customer right at the heart of the kind of energy transition. And it's a really exciting time for the industry, you know, and um, uh, we're excited to see kind of over the next, you know, 18 months, two years as we go through kind of migration and certainly beyond that, um, real evidence that, you know, customers are first, are being placed first, and they are realising the benefits that we've talked about today and we'll continue to talk about. And, um, yeah, it's a really exciting time for the market. Brilliant points, I think. Um, you know, now is the time. You know, I think this working together is crucial. Um, there's lots of parties in this industry that have to come together now to, to make this work. Lots of, you know, parties need to work together to kind of make sure the systems are aligned, to make sure this, you know, all the deadline dates, you know, are achieved. You know, you know, we can't delay this any further. You know, we we have to get to a place where this, you know, operating model is in place that enables um you know, innovation, you know, you know, to keep us going forward. There is a real need to take customers on this journey. Um, you know, there's, there's going to be a huge responsibility on energy suppliers to kind of make sure they're working with their, with their consumers, you know, to take them through this change. But I think there's also parties like ourselves where we'll work with, you know, with energy consumers to also help them as well. You know, there's, there's a real need right now to work together, okay, to kind of to go through this transition to meet the target dates, to make sure that we can all work together, you know, in this new operating model to really enable innovation to take us forward. If you'd like to hear more from energy experts and innovators, please like, follow and subscribe to Energy Matters podcast.